Hi, everybody. This is, once again, Rabbi Ari Goldstein uh, for another one of our uh, My Jewish Story installments. And we're really fortunate uh, today to, that I'm talking to Iris Krasnow. Um, Iris has been a member of our congregation for decades. She's built our congregation on many levels. She and her husband, uh, Chuck, he's built the, the congregation quite literally, and, and Iris has built the congregation somewhat metaphorically, but also quite literally also. Um, but, you know, but not only is Iris such a cherished and treasured member of our community, but she has a really interesting story. And so this is our most recent uh, installment of My Jewish Story with Iris Kras. Now, Iris, welcome and thank you for doing this. You're going to love it. People look and watch these videos and interviews all the time. So you're now going to be a celebrity at the time. Thank you so much for inviting me on the set of the Ari Goldstein Hour. That's right. And have you ever done any interviews before? Uh, have you been interviewed by any important people before? <laughs> well, aside from Ari Goldstein, let's see. Oh, I've been on Oprah twice. I've been on the Today Show twice. I've been on Good Morning America. Uh, I've been on Fox and Friends. Should I? Oh, and I've been on All Things Considered. But this is one of the pinnacles this of my career. And I, I mean this because nobody, you know, it's about faith and family. And it's about evolving from a young child in Oak Park mm -hmm. to a 67 year old, hopefully someday to be grandmother. <laughs> and, you know, a proud member of the Little Shul on the Prairie, which I coined that term when I moved here with four little boys and one younger husband uh 30 years ago wow yeah we're not so little on the shul on the prairie anymore although we try to kind of no you're we, not we, we had 250 members now it's not 350 anymore. but back then we were 150 when you were probably around so it's uh it, exactly right so it's um yeah but it's still sweet when you think about it there's no doubt so oak park that's not chicago but it's chicago where's oak park oak park illinois is the suburb due west of Chicago, uh, famously known as uh, the home of Frank Lloyd Wright, who did many, many beautiful houses. Mm -hmm. And Ernest Hemingway is from Oak Park. Wow. Uh, Oak Park had about, I'd say 1.8% Jews. So I did not grow on the north side of Chicago, Glencoe, Highland Park, and those, uh, you know, the north side is known uh, for being heavily Jewish populated. Uh, Oak Park is not heavily Jewish populated, uh, although we knew all the Jews because we went to temple. Uh, I went to Sunday school, uh, it was confirmed. Uh, it was before the time that all girls had bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, so I was never bat mitzvah. But you know, when you're in a diaspora and when you're in a, a population where there's a very few Jews, which I actually felt somewhat when we moved here, we know each other really well. Right. And we're really right. a tight community. And when my, my sister's from Highland Park, Illinois, and her kids, you know, most of their friends are Jewish. Most of their friends are mirrors of them. And I think my father, I know this for a fact, wanted us to live in a community that more closely mirrored the world. You know, that we didn't, we were going to be in a minority we were definitely going to feel our Judaism because my mother is a Holocaust survivor. I felt it excruciatingly sometimes, soothingly sometimes, but all the time uh, growing up with her. It's, it's, by the way, for anyone who's just not fully understanding the, the language of, of locations or the geography. So you've got Chicago, which is on the, on the Lake Michigan and um, the North shore of Chicago, Evanston, Glencoe, Will, Winnetka, Wilmette Highland Park, that's up north of Chicago, but but bordering on it. And then uh, to the west of Chicago, which is, I mean, not far, but still, but is, is Oak Park, kind of O'Hare area. And yeah, and uh, yeah, but it was beautiful little uh, community. And I would not ever, ever, ever trade the ability to walk a mile by myself at age eight to go to a friend's house um, and, and knew everybody on the block. and. 
I'm still friends with my kindergarten friends. However, unlike my kids who have gone to a small school, the key school from pre-K to 12, my graduating class at Oak Park River Forest High School had 1,300 kids in there. Wow. Uh, and, it, and there's 5,000 people in the high school. So I really grew up uh, with everybody, you know, and I feel like that, uh, I wouldn't say it was diversity so much of cultures then, oh, cultures definitely, but it wasn't like the diverse uh, inclusion and diversity we talk about now. But I mean, a lot of my friends, they're, they're, most of them were Irish Catholic or um, Italian Catholic and their fathers were mailmen. And then the mailman would come home and the mother would go be a nurse for, you know, until 6 a.m. and they'd shift or they'd have 12 kids. And so it, it wasn't, um, you know, that closely knit Jewish community for example, that a lot of my summer camp friends went to. My, I, and, um, my sister and I, when we got to summer camp, Camp Agawak in Manaco, Wisconsin, we thought we were in Israel because <laughs> everybody was Everyone's Jewish. Jewish. And it was nice. It was nice, Rabbi. So you know, it was nice. I totally hear you. We're going to talk about camp in a second, but let's talk about grow, but your house. So your mom was a Holocaust survivor. So how did that affect your house would you feel like you like <clears throat> how would you describe what it meant to be living in the house with a holocaust survivor so i loved my i mean we lived at 926 forest avenue a few blocks down from where frank lloyd wright did all his houses and i just have to mention this some of my friends grew up in frank lloyd wright houses and i didn't even know the value of frank lloyd wright till i married chuck but you'd buy a house like this for thirty thousand dollars in the 50s and 60s um you know, my uh, mother uh, was very involved in in school. Like my teachers would bring my mother to school to talk about World War II. My mother was not in a camp. Um, she was born in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, her family sent her to France because she was 18 years younger. She had three siblings and she was 18 years younger than the other, um, her siblings. And so you know, no one thought that Hitler was going to just kill all the Jews. So her parents sent her to France because we had relatives in France. I think she was 17 or 18 or 19. And her whole family um, went to the camps and died, including like three or four nieces and nephews. And so she was orphaned in Paris and she pretended she was Catholic. She lived as a Catholic for 11 or 12 years. Uh, she lived with a woman named Poupette. Who, who met her uh, serendipitously, randomly, and Poupette was hiding her husband um, in, in her attic. And I believe his name was Gabriel. And so my mother, uh, Poupette said to my mother, what some, so many Jews of the time maybe heard, and I hate this, you don't look Jewish, which meant you don't look like those caricature, ugly characters that the Nazis were putting out. So my mother uh, took the name of, instead of Helene Steinberg, she became Helene Morbier, and she lived with Poupette, and she lived openly. She was an usher in the movie house. She... Uh, lived pretty openly, except she never wore her yellow star. In fact, somewhere in my things, I have her yellow star that she didn't wear. And she said that she felt like when she took the Nazis uh, to their seats as an usherette, they called them, that she had to smile and she was so pretty and just smile a big smile and, and just want to stab them. Um, so what was it like growing up with her? So we, two of her, her one of her brothers, uh, had come to Chicago uh, a year before the occupation, and he survived. And she, well, first of all, when she came to Chicago, she didn't speak English. And my father was 36, and he hadn't married, and she was 33, and he married her. But two of her first cousins were in camps. So I remember being really young and having um, Howard and uh, Jacques who they were uh, in my house, and they had blue numbers on their arms. And so uh, you know, and just it, this was long before the popularity of tattoos. And so, you know, we 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 lived what people learned in 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 history. You know, we just lived it all the time. My mother all, cried often. She had a photograph, a tattered black and white photograph of her family um, that she used to carry in her hand sometimes. And sometimes I'd come home and she'd be on a, a, this blue striped chair in our living room and just 
just sad. I mean, when, when she talked, like when I talk about the fact that I lost my father at 31, I, I feel so sad. I'm so sad. Um, I, or when I lost my mother at 51, it just fills me with so much emotion. Right. But the thought, Rabbi, of having your loved ones burnt and Rip, it, ripped it, you know, away like, from you, separated, ripped away from you, and then exterminated. Torch. And, and, and going through this Ukraine now, I, I, it is so unbearable. And my father's parents were from Odessa right. um, and they weren't ripped away. They came to Chicago and they lived, um, you know, not a great life, but they lived. Right. So anyway, how, do, how does it feel? And it's interesting because I did my part of my master's thesis on, you know, the second generation. I don't feel like I have that inherited guilt, like why me? I, my mother was remarkably hopeful. She always said, I, I don't look at what I had. Um, I look at I, what I had, I look at what I have. Or my father used to say in a Yiddish accent, although he'd say, you know what? That was, was, you know, it was, was. And, and so she was remarkably hopeful. You could, when the Holocaust Museum was built in Washington, they wanted to get her story in the Northwestern Jewish Historical Society. And she didn't really want to go through the excruciating details, not with anybody. She just didn't want to do that. And she just, she, she had, she said, you know, and she talked like this, she says, oh, I, you know, that was a terrible time, but I have three children and I have eight grandchildren and I have a great husband and this is my life. And so I'm filled with hope about life. I thought it was terrible what she went through and she was tough. You know, she was not easy. It was, there was strict rules and, you know, she wasn't, she was so loving, but very strict. And interestingly, and I bet other women listening to this who are in their sixties might think the same way. I spent a lot of my rebellious teenage years wishing my mother belonged to someone else. You know, the blonde mothers from Oak Park who served bologna sandwiches, like people came to my house and they had like blintzes or strange foods or, and, and, but only to grow up to discover the best parts of me uh, are the parts about her that I loathe. I'm, I'm resilient, I'm hopeful, very organized and I'm strict. And, you know, so those qualities that came from you know, sometimes I think she really had to mother herself. You know, it wasn't like she well, had. She didn't have a mother. Yeah. So she grew up resilient and independent. And when she talks about eating from garbage cans, which they did, rotten potatoes, uh, you know, she says it with glee. You know, we always, not glee, but like we always got those potatoes. We, we got those potatoes. Pride. It was prideful. But so do you feel as if, do you feel as if the experiences she had, I mean, obviously who's to know, and I get the fact, there's no way to know with certainty, but do you feel like the type of person she was a mother and the type of household she kind of ran uh, was a reflection of her experiences in the Holocaust? I mean, obviously you have to assume yes, but like in what, do you feel as if there are ways you can think of? Was she, did she like, what was dinner time like, or, you know, at your house? Was it, was, did she like make, twice as much as she needed because she, you know, she had these memories of people not having enough or did she kind of make, say, Hey, you don't need that much. We didn't have, you know, this teaches you character. Like, was there anything like you think back on, especially with respect to food rituals? Which, so that's uh, a good question. It sounds to me like you've heard the answer to this before. First of all, no different answers, said, like different people have different experiences. You know, I, just, if we didn't finish everything on our plate, and, and we ate like clock, we ate at seven, 12 and five. And I went to an elementary school where you went, you went home for lunch. And my mother, there was always lunch on the table. And by the way, we did get into bologna and cheese sandwiches, but you know, there was always lunch on the table and our house was very, very clean. And we always had a lot of food, but around food, you know, I could have, uh, the way it, it wasn't, you ate what you ate on the table and it was always, meat or fish and a starch and vegetables. It was not, we, we didn't have like, uh, you know, and we also ate liver and tongue and brains, you know, there, there was no part of the animal 
and we didn't eat pork, but we ate, you know, there was, it, it, she didn't cook pork, but we did eat bacon. I admit it, we were, reform, we were conservative, but there was no part of the animal that we didn't eat. And so I was never squeamish about food. I mean, we ate snails, we ate weird food, but if you didn't, when I'm going to go forward, because first of all, we had to eat everything on our table. And I'm sure I was chubby at one point, um, but dessert was not to be eaten first. And then once you ate, you didn't eat anymore. You know, it wasn't like snacking at eight. It was just food was very regimented. There was always enough of it. And you finished it. And if you didn't finish, oh, you know, I used to starve. And, you know, uh, you, you remember, I, I, you know, and we remembered. And you know what? I remember that now. I think about that now. And when I hear today that there are people in these places in the Ukraine that don't have any food, and we sit down and, and, you know, I just went out to lunch to the Severn Inn and had a fish taco that could have fed five people. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, so my thing now is I know what it's like to be hungry, not personally, but we were reminded of that. So flash forward, Helene Krasno's in my kitchen with four sons and a couple of them picky eaters and really, um, you know, open up your mouth. And really my kids, when they remember my mother, they often bring up the fact that your mother made us eat everything. And, you know, and, and they, a couple of them were picky. And so, you know, their memory is a little bit like, uh, but you know, it's interesting. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this and maybe you feel like this, I think I'm the same way. I mean, I, we, we ate definitely at the same time. We always ate by 5.30 and now my kids, you know, they're like in their late twenties and thirties. And they say, when people say, let's have dinner at nine, we're, we're always starving. By right. five, you know? like, we're the same way in my house for sure. So early and Chuck's like from the Eastern shore of Maryland where they ate early and we just eat early. You know, my mother used to say, whatever you eat after six turns to fat or something. Mm -hmm. And so we just ate early. And, you know, I raised my kids almost on an identical militant schedule. I mean, everything happened at the same time in my house. And, you know, in the end, I could count on my mother. And what a, what a great gift to be consistent and predictable. I mean, that's almost the best gift you can give to a kid, right? Yeah, no, I think- being, being everything disciplined and they can you can rely on things for sure that's a very important element of parenting let me ask you a question about your mom really quickly do you, i mean and this obviously is, is a much harder and because i'm not talking about you i'm talking about your mom but it, it could be very revealing and reflective of you do you ever remember your your mom talking about god oh yes um Wow. I'm going to tell you a story and oh I wish that I knew how to share screen but I uh, so well, I can I don't have you as a, a it's kid. okay I, I'm going to send I'm going to send you a picture that I think would be fun to accompany with this so so in the last days of the war when the Americans had come and um, liberated you know France like that they were killed you know people were free like the th four days a week before for the liberation, she was living with Poupette and um, so, some, and my mother was like five, three, she wasn't very tall. Um, and, and she said that these Nazis came to the door and she said, they looked like they were seven, knock, knock, knock on the door. And they said, um, and she answered the door and they said, Helene Morbier, we know who you are. We know you're Helene Steinberg. So there had been an informer. Oh my so God. My mother, I know, oh my God, you go through 11 years of this um, stuff, I won't say the other S word. Uh, and, and so my mother, and I will never forget this story, instead of whatever she thought, she went into the kitchen and, and Pupette wasn't home. And she got, she said, I got the biggest knife I could find. And I, and I went blade first to these Nazis. And I said, here, take the knife. If you want to take me, take me dead. And she's speaking in French. She spoke beautiful French. In fact, I never, ever remember her speaking Polish. And, and she gave it and she handed it to this Nazi, one of them, German soldiers, Nazis, Nazis, right. you know. And she looked at him and she said, and maybe you have a daughter. So think about you taking me and think about your daughter that where she's going to go, she's going to go and get burned alive, burned alive. And so the Nazis holding the knife and my mother said she fell on her knees 
And she said, oh, please, dear God. She said that she said, God damn it, please, dear God. God save me, damn it, please save me, please save me. And, you know, so, so I knew that she believed in God. I knew, oh God, please, you know. And she stood up and, you know, she said she fell on her knees and all she could see was like a seven, like someone your size, you know. And she got up and the guy dropped the knife and they left. Wow. Well, no, the reason why I was asking, I was talking about like afterwards, you know, but clearly even during, I mean, she said she still was kind of, even if it was in her own way praying, like I know a lot of people had a very um, conflicted Tortured. feeling about God, you know, post Holocaust, because how do you- Well, watch? Jacob, the God wrestler, you right. know, well, I'll tell you another um, story. Uh, so I interviewed Ellie Vissell mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I spent a whole day with him in his apartment in New York. And he, I said, how can you believe in God? And he said, how, just like you can't believe there was a God during the Holocaust, you can't believe there, there, uh, you can't believe there wasn't a God because so many people survived. And I told my mother this story and she says, oh, give me his phone number. And I said, mom, I mean, you know, I, and she, I, I, you tell him my story. There's a God. Mm -hmm. I prayed to my God and it came through. Another thing she used to say, my dad died when she was 65 and, and, and she used to always say, uh, and then in, in her later life, she had one of her leg, half a leg amputated. And I'd say, mom, I, you know, in my early fifties, I'd say, mom, I don't know how you did this. You know, it's there's life is so hard, you know, teenage sons, marriage, work. And I mean, believe me, I, my life compared to so many people is, it wasn't hard. She says, oh, Iris, you know, my husband died. I lost my leg. I lost a lot of my friends. My children live over everywhere, but nobody can ever take my God away. Wow. Nobody can ever take my faith away. And I, I feel that because of that, when I feel alone, I never feel lonely. I mean, when I'm alone, I never feel lonely. Nobody can ever take my God away. Nobody can ever take my faith away. Does that not say it all? Yes, it says it all. It's very powerful. It's very powerful. It means that she never, ever, no matter what she saw and the hardships that she saw and the, the, and the, and the, the vile nastiness that was so deeply part of her life, for the longest time, um, she never, she remained strong. That's, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. Tell me about camp. So you, wh where'd you go to camp? Wisconsin, Dude, as you, you said, with camp. your Chicago accent, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. So right. I, this is my seventh book and I'm not trying to sell it, but I, I love camp. I went to summer camp at Camp Agawak in Minocqua, Wisconsin, starting at age eight, uh, ending at 18, uh, but it didn't end because I went back 40 years right. later, but it, but most of the campers, when I went were Jewish right. and we were, my sister and I, I just remember being at the bus, uh, well, we took an overnight train at age eight, no cell phones, nothing. And it was, and we, we had a Friday night service, but it was very loose. It wasn't a quote, Jewish camp, like camp right. shot, you know, but everyone was Jewish and I loved camp and I, I loved camp mostly because you know this pre title 9 if you're if you were an athletic girl you didn't you weren't on a soccer team or a lacrosse team or a basketball they, we i played half court basketball and you know with a wiffle ball you know it just everybody it wasn't for the girls and so not only did you get to be athletic and we were really competitive i was with a bunch of jewish girls and it really meant a lot to me it, it i learned a lot about what it means in, to be Jewish, because when you're with a lot of people that aren't Jewish, you're still Jewish, but you're not in a community. Um, you're, it, you know, when I sit in services, um, and, and when I peeked in on you uh, in the Purim uh, outfit, which I thought you were just scaringly beautiful, Thank you. Um, you know, but <laughs> the community of everybody just, you know, it was, it was sort of a mask free, one of the first mask free events, although a lot of people and, and just that that fervor of the spirit of communal Judaism and Purim, which is such a weird holiday. Um, and, you know, and I was so happy you didn't dress as Mordechai. You know, you're always on the edge. That's why we love you. That's why I helped hire you, but that's, that's right. <laughs> um, no, but I loved, I loved that feeling of just being Jewish and not just saying, 
oh, you know, wasn't religious services or Sunday school. I really liked Sunday school, by the way. But you were living you know, it. You were just living it with other Jewish people all the time. Yeah. And it was just, you know, Ive, you could say schmaltz, you could say other SCH words, you could say stup. You, and I mean, you know, I didn't say that at eight, maybe at 18. Um, but anyway, you just talked the language. And and I loved summer camp. And I the reason I wrote this book. Camp Girls, Fireside's Lessons on Friendship, Courage, and Loyalty, because at my camp's 84th reunion, um, I was talking to the new owner who was half my age. Well, she was not half my age. And I said, oh my God, I love camp. I used, I used to write for Agalog all the time. That's where I got my literary start. And she said, why don't you come back to camp and, and restart Agalog and, and work for us? So for the past eight years, I've been working back at my summer camp 40 years after I was a camper. So I love the camp spirit. I, I love the kibbutz communal environment. And I'm the mother of four sons. So going to an all girls camp with, you know, get a little power. estrogen in your life as opposed to. The oh, my <laughs> God. Yes. And, and just like, you know, it, it's just very Hamish. And, yeah. and I love it. I'm, I'm probably just going to go for three weeks this summer. I usually go for seven. And, you know, it's a departure. And I love the Midwest. I mean, the Midwest is very cold. I mean, cold, yes. but it really breeds a hearty soul. Like when I meet people from Chicago or Ohio, we understand each other. You know, we're not like, we're not fancy people. That's I don't right. think we're, we're not fancy. Nope. I know. I worked in Chicago for two years. I, I know you worked in the North Shore. You worked. What temple did you work Glencoe, at? I forgot. At the at the, uh, at the the at the one on on Lake Cook Road and Sheridan Road called North Shore Congregation Israel. It's beautiful, beautiful. Very beautiful. fancy. Now wasn't was that fancy. fancy? It was very fancy. Yeah, I mean, our temple. When people come to our temple, well, unfortunately, even though my husband Chuck Anthony was the architect of this temple, none of our four sons got to have their bar mitzvahs in this temple. That's one. Right. Uh, Theo, who's now 32, had his bar mitzvah in the house that where the roof fell in. He was the last bar mitzvah uh -huh. before the roof fell in. I and remember. then there were the trailers, uh, which you couldn't, your head couldn't even I fit. Remember. In the trailer. I remember. So then and and the three other ones, Isaac, uh, uh, Isaac Jack Jack and all were, I remember all three of those bar mitzvahs for sure. For and sure. they were all almost as tall as you. But nobody got to have a bar mitzvah in, in this beautiful, but what, what people always said, even in the trailers, I love this temple. It's so unfancy. Meanwhile, we're in a trailer, right? <laughs> you know, but, but even when, <laughs> but even when they go to our synagogue now, if there, there's a, a simplicity, it's about the people. It's not fancy. It's not, not fancy. you know, when I went to t the temple in, in uh, Washington, Washington Hebrew, they had a motorized ark. Like someone pressed a button and the ark opened. We don't do that, right? You and Merv opened the ark. That's right. And, and, and uh, but I should speak to someone about getting our ark because uh, uh, motorized. After all, it was your husband who designed that ark, and uh, and, and I'm that, actually yeah didn't just design yeah. but but crafted that ark. But so my, I just got, want a, a My husband hand sculpted that ark yeah. just so you, I mean, and he, the girl with the crazy hair, he said he did it after me and my hair is not so crazy anymore. Maybe it is, but Chuck, like every single inch of that and the hands that open up the ark and, you know, there's so much hand craftsmanship and love in that temple from a guy who used to be Methodist. I know, but actually what's, and then to bring this story full circle is if my memory serves me correctly, the 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 time that he was crafting this ark it's at its most at the core of the time that he was crafting it was when you were away at camp because i, I remember was, going into your living room in the middle of your living room and think with this huge thing down and thinking to myself oh my god thank god iris isn't around <laughs> because this thing is oh, taking no, up he, the living room well, he worked like a mad artist. He'd have concrete on his face and his hair was wild. Oh, Amazing. well, I think he built some stuff in our bathroom. We have a big bathroom, but everything was, I was at camp. Right. Um, and I, and, you know, and he was, and then, you know, you got to talk about you, so much of his inspiration, Ari, came from your trip to Israel, like where he saw temples and Jerusalem stone and 
he really wanted to go to Israel so I know, that he could But do we're not going to talk job. about Chuck as much as I would love to. We're going to talk about you. And trust me, okay. nothing would make me to... happier than to talk about this sanctuary and his vision for it and how he was inspired by it. But we're going to stop talking about it. And maybe I'll have him on for another My Jewish Story. But let's talk about, so camp, like, you know, your experiences at camp remind me of the reason why people who move to Israel do so. Lots of people who move to Israel, it's not because they want all this necessary, like they're orthodox, but rather because they just want to go and live in a place in which things are function at the rhythm of the Jewish calendar and people speak kind of like a, a similar language of Judaism, even if they're not necessarily like so observant. It sounds to me like that was part of the joy of you going to camp was you being able just to be part of like a people that speak a little shorthand with each other and um well, you just felt, um, you know, I felt like I was with my sister, you know, and I was with my sister, but the, the, the takeaway from my experience at summer camp, um, I am my best friends. Like if I have six best friends in the world, three of them are from summer camp. Um, me and Margie and Liz, I talked to a, a camp friend by text or by email, or we Zoomed our way through the pandemic almost every day. And, and my friends from camp, my 65-year-old friends from camp and 170, they come up and visit every time I'm up there. There was such a uh, connection born not of blood, but of history, you know, love and loyalty. You know, we just were, when you sleep nose to nose in a freezing cabin, you know, for eight, 10 years, you know people pretty well. And you know what? I still think about this. I don't think I thanked my parents enough for giving, for letting go. I mean, there were no cell phones. There were no, now you go to camp, people take pictures every minute and parents call us and say, oh, I saw Susie. She wasn't smiling. What was wrong? Yeah. You know, and I'm like, I, I hate that part of it. That <laughs> the, our parents, my parents put us on a train overnight and then they went to France. My mother's family still lives in France and they went to France almost every summer. And then they came for parents weekend. So after a month, you didn't talk to your parents. And so to breed that kind of independence community and to subtly teach us about Judaism and not in the over your head, ortho, right. I'm sorry, orthodox, subtle, right. very subtle infusion, assimilation. Boy, I can tell you one thing from the get go. I knew I was a Jew. Yeah, I mean, and, and think about it now, like so many of the, of your most intense, closest friends, and I'm not, I don't want to make a judgment about who your friends are. Oh, they are, no, but, they're, like, but it's like, but so are. many, no, no, but here, and like, when you think about it, your closest friends, it's like, you feel, you've always been drawn to Jewish friends. It's very sweet, and probably as a result of your experiences at camp, and I got to tell you, you made me think about it, your mom you know, going back to the to the blend of Holocaust and letting go, like wow, what a dr what a drama that must have been for her every year to, to like to say goodbye to you and just to assume and to rely on the fact that you were going to be back in four weeks, right? Two uh, such a good question. So first of all, uh, uh, um, the word camp, the word. Oh camp, my God! Yeah, of course. The word, <laughs> the the word camp right now evokes joy and summer and, right. and, and life and and the word camp itself and i i did talk to my mom about this but i'll tell you a story when we were four years old i was four my sister was five my brother was three we went to the jcc camps in chicago and we would stay and, and we had these shirts that said jcc jewish community center and we would stand in front of our house and and my mother would be right by the door and she'd give us these lunch boxes and she'd say hold your lunch boxes in front of your shirts. Make sure that you don't, you, you, nobody sees JCC. She was afraid that somebody would, she just, we, and I can envision the three of us holding our little lunch boxes until the bus came. And so it, for a wow. woman who, who never knew whether she would see her family again or, or to just unleash and let her kids, you know, well, anyway, the camp was like 40 minutes away, but boy, she, we knew, but then the, and my dad didn't like that. I remember. And he would talk to us and say, no, one's going to take you away. But, you know, I think there was some, what's wrong with being Jewish? 
right? Well, now it goes back to remember when I asked you before about how what, did she raise you and was how how the Holocaust affected the way that she raised you? Well, there you mm -hmm. go. Sounds to me like she was again. There's not. There's. I'm not judging it, but like a very overprotective, worried, very overprotective, and, and worried, so constant worry mother. You know, in which she just, you know, like do this, do that, make sure, you know, like because who knows, who knows what's going to happen, who's going to see you, and and who can blame her? No. So there's no judging. I'm just like aware, like wow, to grow up like it that. Is big, wow. Girl. No, and it's a big well, but that could go in another direction. She could have been a Holocaust survivor who was so overprotective that her kids said, I'm, right. I, I'm, I don't want anything to do with you. Um, and I'm not going to follow your rules. I, I don't feel like my rebellion was such that I, I always loved her. I was afraid of her some somewhat, you know, like she was uh, irrepressible <laughs> and indefatigable and, and on uh, the, on immovable force and you know like and and you know what I, I will do anything I, because of her and because of what my barometer my mother used to say if Hitler didn't get me nothing will get you that's right and so my and my barometer of bad and she'd always say oh things could always be worse mm -hmm. I think if she saw Ukraine right now it, it would I, I am for the first time so happy she's not seeing old women with canes and crying and hungry and it's unthinkable what this brings up for the Jewish people for all people but for us oh my yeah. god and if you and, and and what you're correctly pointing out is and just to to add a, a more positive spin on this is that considering what she went through it's remarkable how open she was to trusting e even though her trust almost was halfway but she still did it she still sent you on the bus to at four years old to go to jcc camp and she said just cover your shirt up but she still sent you she still put you on a train to go to an overnight camp assuming i mean train to a camp it's a very like these images are I strong know, right she still did it it's pretty amazing the type of person that she was that she um that she was able to kind of just cope with her feelings and still not, and not necessarily make it so that she was depriving you of, you know, a lifetime of experiences. She dealt with her own struggles and- She loved this country. I mean, she, when she talks about coming from Ellis Island, the kissing the ground and, and going to work at Saks Fifth Avenue and selling French perfume and meeting my father. I mean, if you can put the darkest past behind you and move forward, which not everyone can do. My mother was able to embrace the windy city of Chicago, which she loved. And they ended up moving from Oak Park and living right in an apartment right across from Lake Michigan. And even after my dad died, which she lived another 21 years, I think just sitting there alone with the shimmer of the lake, pictures of her eight grandchildren, you know, my sister lives in Chicago with her three kids and in Highland Park. And, you know, it, I, I, I do think my mother always had a sense of self that was so sturdy uh, and, and I'm sure lonely at times. And I know she thought about her parents a lot. Like she, she would say things like, well, my mother, my mommy used to say, and, you know, her father was very successful. When you see pictures of him, I mean, big beard. Uh, he, he was a glazier. He made windows. You know, the, these people were ripped out of their lives and successful family lives. Her brother uh, had little children. Um, I remember when my sister and I got married, we both said we're going to have a lot of kids to uh, replicate what was lost. And she has four, I have four, you know, and, and I think there was this urgency in, in me to, and I didn't plan on the twins. But, you know, <laughs> I got the bonus, and I know you have four. So I was you going know, to say something, but I'm glad you. you, you can, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean I know you only had two when I met you, but hey, um, <laughs> four is a crowd. But you know the, the thought of um, giving back in a way where you're populating the country, the world with more Jews just felt really good. It does feel good. Where'd you go to college? I graduated from Stanford University in 1976, oh. um, and uh, I had, and this wasn't a rebellion, but um, I, my biggest boyfriends 
were not Jewish. And it really was a sting to my mother. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of it, like I would say, well, you raised us in Oak Park. Why didn't we live in, you know, and, um, but I didn't marry them. Right. Um, you know, but I, you know, I've just, I know. Isn't that was about, also a lot of your dad's influence too. Yeah. Oh my God. We didn't even talk about him. I know. You know, he, he was Henry Krasno and Margaret Krasno came from Odessa in like 1916 and they had three kids and Henry Krasno was the first Russian doctor in the city of Chicago. And he brought so many Russians into the city of Chicago and, or I think they were Ukrainians or Russians. And he was, um, he, and it, my dad grew up in the depression and he graduated college at 19. Uh, he put his family, he put himself through Northwestern and he started a company that made little cabinets and he ended up being one of the pioneers of computer furniture. The company still exists. It's called Marvel, M-A-R-V-E-L. And uh, he died a uh, year after he retired. You know, people used to retire at 65 and retirement so often means a uh, lack of self-identity and, you know, purpose. Like who am I, who am I without my, and now people, I mean, my big boss at AARP where I'm, you know, the editor of a online, senior editor of an online publication for women, she's 84. She's as feisty as they come. And, right. you know, people in their 90s, you and I know some people in their 90s in the congregation who, you know, are out every night. Right. And at least we know now also that, that, that your job does not necessarily mean your identity and that a person is, you know, we are individuals separate from our jobs. And so we can retire and still have you know, identities and lives, but there was a point, many, you know, back in that generation in which your job was your identity. And when you retired, it meant you were now just kind of just like winding your way down to death, but not. Well, only. people didn't live as long. I mean, women in their nineties now are the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing segments of the aging population and men in their eighties. So now at 67, if I managed to dodge killer diseases in right. you, we we can look into our 90s and so and also i think the pandemic made a lot of us realize uh, the power of home the power of gardening the power of not being having so many choices to just be home you That's know right. the power of home the power of community the power of zoom for you to bring judaism into like we never you never wavered you know we could always watch a zoom or just feel connected to our communities. And I think that was really good. I, think on your there, I agree. I think that's, you know, the, the everything that you're saying is totally right. I feel like that the, the pandemic did a lot, I mean, it was brutal <laughs> on so many levels. There's no doubt about it, but I mean, but at the same time it did like, I, I think about at least a half dozen, probably closer to a dozen relationships that I rekindled as a result of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think about how much more I read during the pandemic. I was reading all the time. And I, you know, it's like it's every time, new book, new book, new book. And, you know, now it's slowing down again, you know, but I love the reading. It's like, so, so there are positives, there's no doubt. But tell me about, so Stanford, you were at Stanford. You were like, did you, did you do anything? Like typically when a person goes to college, that's when they drop their Judaism. Like, uh, do you feel that that's your story too? Well, uh... You know, I went to uh, services and I had these two Jewish friends in the law school. Um, but my, I would say my crowd, um, my roommate was Jewish and I, and she's still one of my best friends. And I just kind of got placed with her, um, Amy. And, um, and yeah, I think that we, you know, again, I wasn't somebody that, um, was orthodox we were we went to a conservative temple and so my judaism is so embedded in my soul and heart that and i was used to being with non-jewish people so i i you know as my mother said nobody could ever take your faith away nobody so i was jewish but it wasn't uh not as much observance yeah, yeah, it, yeah. and if any if any not to mention all of your uh, camp friends it's not like you had cell phones and so keeping in touch with camp friends was so hard back then, right? I mean, I remember I for me, 
Did was, you go, you went to camp too, right? I went to right? a summer camp and I loved it, but I couldn't keep in touch with these people. You had to write letters. And you I know, know if you're writing letters every day, you know, you just wrote a letter from here, you know, and it's hard. I love that, but I went, I still went to camp. So I kept in touch with people, but you know, I, I would say, that now, I mean, I don't, I don't even want to get into it, but I, I, I mean, I, and I'm not going to, because it's like a whole other three hours that we can talk about Jewish kids who are not big supporters of Israel now, or, you know, but I'm a college professor for more than 30 years. I teach journalism at American University. Now I'm an emerita, but I still teach. And um, I ha I'm teaching a class right now and a feature article, right? And there's 18 kids in there, all women. Uh, and some Jewish um, women, and we talk about um, Jewish identity and the emerging sense of Jewish identity and the challenge of some uh, identity being anti-Israel, but feeling intensely Jewish. And so, you know, it's such a different conversation than me and my friends had. And, and I, I'm telling you something that you know so glaringly, so much deeper than I do. But it's interesting for me, I, you know, I can't be a judgy, um, oh, and really some of our dinner table conversations. You know, I live, my husband's Jewish. Uh, he converted with the rabbi on the Israel trip. That's all we'll say about Chuck. And, um, he and it's fantastic, and so we can have a, a conversation with our four sons and Chuck and I at the table. And one of our sons might say something that um, is uh, anti that that comes across as anti-Israel. And Chuck always says, "You need to understand the history. You guys are coming at this." And and he'll go into a history lesson. Not that you can convert a kid who's part of a movement started by Jews, really, but he always just, you know, very calmly will say, "You need to understand the history. You know, you need to understand the history that this is not like Nazi Germany." And it it's really hard for me. Hardly, yeah. And it's not even so, like it's, it, it, uh, yeah, totally. I, that's amazing. I'm so proud of Chuck, though. <laughs> because you have to understand the history. Meanwhile, he knows more history than than I do. Right. But it, it it really rips at my heart when you find an anti-Semitic Jew. What, and my father used to say the same thing. He'd say, there's nothing worse than an anti-Semitic Jew. And I'd say, what do you mean, daddy? And, you know, I still called him daddy because he, and he'd say, you know, there's just some Jews that aren't, don't want to be Jews. Like, you know, uh, I was just with somebody the other day and she said, oh, my, my mother just found out that she's Jewish. I said, really? Yeah, she didn't know, but she did, you know, she knew. And, and her grandparents knew and everyone knew. And when Madeline Albright, you know, who I liked a lot, found out she was Jewish, guess what? You didn't find out today. That's right. And so, you know, that I've always said, and again, I remember my parents saying, you stand up straight and be proud of who you are and you're Jewish. And a lot of people don't like Jews. That's right. So you gotta, you know, well, I don't know what to say. I've always been- to, to, And with respect to, to Israel and, your, and the kids and stuff like that, so often, you know, we live in a time right now in which, which it, it's, it's fashionable to look at a circumstance in the world and say, oh, these people appear to be the underdog. And so therefore we are going to speak out against what, you know, the, the non-underdog or what appears to be the oppressor. But it's not so simple as that. In fact, and in the case of Israel, it's not even close to as simple as that, but it's like, but the point is, is that that is a value that we share, which is that when it appears as if, you know, when there appears to be an underdog, we want to come to their, come to their, to their aid and come, come to their defense. And that's, you know, something which we, I admire about young people right now, but unfortunately, sometimes it's very easy to not look at the big picture, but just to look at a little snapshot of something and then assume that that's what, that, that is a reflection of the big picture, but not about well, your kids. <laughs> no, but as Chuck says, understand the history, you know, yeah. and, and, and I have to understand the history. And, but it's and not even about the history. Sometimes it can be about the present, right? It's right. like what appears to be, even though I fully agree the about the history, but what appears to be, oh, Israel oppressing is, oh, but do you think that they like you know, having checkpoints? It's because they have been day after day, you know, you know, defending from people crossing into the border for the purposes of doing bad things. And so as a result, they are 
they have checkpoints, not exactly what we like doing, but it's kind of what we fo what we're forced to do. And so that's even the present, not forget the forget the history, which I agree with you about this or Chuck about the history. Yeah, well, what can you love? Um, can you love Judaism and, and, and have issues with some part of Israel politics? Sure. Yes, can you love sure the you United States? And, and anyway, can I you love your family? Love can you love your can you love your family? But 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 struggle with some of the things that they do. Yes, yes, yes. hundred percent. And, 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 you know, the one thing that I'm thinking about as we talk is like one thing I love about Jewish culture and, and who I've become and, and our temple, which is no longer the little shul on the prairie, um, is this feeling of connectedness and this feeling of community and, and this thing that like in the end, all you want is to love and be loved and to feel connected to other people. I mean, right. in the end, isn't that what, it's not what everybody wants. I mean, there's not, it's not what, you know, it's some really evil people want, but to me, I love being part of a large family and I love being part of the Annapolis family. That's I write right. a column for the That's Annapolis right. Capitol. I was at the Severn Inn today and a table right. of women who were probably uh, even older than me, we're like, oh, we read your column, you know, don't you? And I, I just love our town because you go to Whole Foods and you know 10 people. I mean, you and I have seen each other right. at Safeway almost every time I go, right. and, you know, and, and so that feeling of community and connectedness is so Jewish. Right. There's no doubt about it. And our, and our need to, we know who our parents are. We know who our grandparents are. We know what they did and how they, and, 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 the, and, and in case, especially in the case of your family and extended family, the struggles that they had to get us to this place. And we feel this kind of this, this magnetic pull to make sure that we are, are, we respect those great values that they worked so hard to make sure would be here for us. Well, you used the word overprotective with my mother and, and she was so overprotective and my children all tell me that I was overprotective and that I, didn't let them do things that other kids were doing. And, and I don't have a lot of regrets. I, you know, I, I, I they turned I, out just fine. Didn't they? Well, they turned out just fine. Um, the, the part of it I don't like is that they're feeling, I, I never want a kid's perception to be that their friends think that they're overprotected, but in the end, you know, if you give a child the foundation of love, and consistency, and and if they know you can, they can count on you. You know, my kids know, even though I'm not a perfect mother by far, they can count on me. And it's beyond Venmo, it's <laughs> beyond you know being an ATM machine. It's they can count on me, and okay. and they sure can count on Chuck, and I can count on Chuck, and I can count on my, you know, friends from Temple Beth Shalom that I could call and they would do anything for me. Tell me a little bit about your about um, about how Judaism has affected your your life, you know, as a, as a mom. Like, tell me about what the things that became most important to you with respect to Judaism and your family. When you created, well, not always, when you came from. So I always have to. Um, I lived in. We moved here in uh, 1994, I think, or 1993. And one of the first phone calls that I had, the rabbi then said, "Oh, you have to talk to Randy Altschiller." So. Um, I ended up talking to Randy and I lived here for two weeks and I get a call from Randy and says, do you, how would you feel about being on the board? Cause I'd already <laughs> loved the temple. And I said, oh, all right, I'll be on the board. I've been here. I said, why do you, <laughs> why do you want me on the board? She said, well, you're smart and Jewish and you're from, you know, Washington. And so that summer I started uh, the summer, the kids summer camp and I was head of the nursery school committee. Um, and, and so that little camp that exists right now, and, and, and the reason I did it is for my kids. I wanted right. them to go to camp. And so I, and then I worked at the camp and then I became head of the nursery school committee. And then when our nursery school director suddenly uh, pulled out in August, the then rabbi called me and said, and I had three kids in the nursery school. He said, would you like to be the nursery school teacher? And I said, sure. <laughs> so Mary Henschel and I became the nursery school teachers. Oh, wow. And then I became a member of the temple board for, for a while. And, and then, and then, and then, and then, you know, so. But what about so, inside your own house? 
inside the house, we always did menorahs. We always, we did not do Friday night services, but you know, it was always about the kids. So, right. you know, inside my house is inside Annapolis, you know, the temple's four minutes away from my house. So, but you know, I, I, nobody, I, we don't do Shabbat all the time. What about Pesach? Do you, how do you observe Passover? Definitely. We've done Passover with other families that oh, yeah. belong to the temple. Um, we're right now we're all talking on whose house it's going to be. <laughs> um, and, and we always, 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 always uh, go to Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah right, and, and sure. the kids for years have come. We have the same seats. Thank you, Mary West. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I I know where I want to sit in the temple. I know. Oh, I know I, where you can be seated. I can imagine looking at you. You know, <laughs> I love looking at you, and I love looking at the sculptures. But right now, also, how does Judaism translate to? I always feel like it's my um, responsibility as who I am and how I got to. Be, I mean, I'm alive. You know, I maybe wouldn't be here. So uh, recently, for the last two years, I've been on the board of the uh, Jewish Museum of Maryland, um, you know, which is fantastic. It's in um, uh, Baltimore, in Baltimore, near Atman's Deli. That's the way you would know where it is. And that's been such an honor to be part of the JMM and, and to learn about um, Judaism and, and how so many Jews moved here like hundreds of years ago, you know, mm -hmm. Maryland. And, um, you know, I do what I can uh, for the temple. It, let's put it this way. If anyone asks me to do anything and I can do it, I'll do it for oh, our I temple. Didn't, I wasn't suggesting, I was asking no, I about know. like Judaism, like how, how have you become the Jewish mother? Like what's your, like what's your Jewish mother story? How did you surrender to Jewish motherhood? <laughs> well, I did write a book called Surrendering to Motherhood. That was my first book. It should be Surrendering um, to Jewish Motherhood. <laughs> well, I, I feel like, so in interesting like i i am one of the things i've never liked is when like um people jews will make like jewish stereotypical jokes mm -hmm. like oh you, we like you because you're not a princess like right. people yeah. have said that to me you're from oak park you're not a princess well i think that's like a real uh criticism you know yes. and so the the stereotype of the Jewish mother is, you know, doting and oh, honey, you know, and, and, you know, like uh, worried, worried, worried. I don't think I have become that. My kids have been, you know, Theo Anthony, my God, he went to the Congo. He's jumped out of airplanes. You know, he, he's just told us while he was home yesterday that he has a film festival in Czechoslovakia at the end of April. I don't know if it's going to happen, but I don't know how we did it, but this Jewish mother who is so overprotective and every time they get on a plane, I make, when they land, I make them text me landed mm -hmm. and who worries every day about everything. My kids are fiercely independent and, 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 you know, they've all found their own way out of the cocoon. Mm -hmm. However, in my heart, I'm like my mother. I kiss them hard when I leave them and I hug them. I just hugged Theo goodbye this morning. He's six feet five. I was at his like pupic, <laughs> but I gave him like the biggest, biggest hug because you never know, right? I do know the eggshell thin line between life and death. And I've known it since I was a little girl. Yeah. And, and that's my legacy. And that's my history yeah. is that I didn't read about the Holocaust in history books. I learned about it at the dinner table. I learned it by a mother who was sometimes very sad and very strict and sometimes very militant um, just because uh, that was her story. And so it's been a real um, challenge uh, for me to let go to learn how to parent adult children that aren't little children anymore uh, as they find their own way. Um, but you know, they all know they're Jewish. Yeah. So that was a real success. All right, I got one last question. And we've probably been talking for quite some time. So one last one. Almost an hour, but it's good. It's been good. So here's my last question. So um, tell me, 17 years ago, your husband, went on my first Temple Beth Shalom Israel trip and he secretly because he didn't want it, it wasn't because like 
about this big secret, but rather he didn't want it to be you have, he wanted to make it a, about this is his experience and didn't want to put it on you to have feel like this was had something you were putting pressure or not or whatever it was. And so he wanted this to be his own personal experience. And he came home uh, after spending a few weeks in Israel and said, hey, guess what? <laughs> um, you'll never believe what happened. What did what was what did you feel then? So this might take three minutes. So, you know, he met with you for a two year period and you, you guys would go out for dinner and, and he'd meet with you for like two, twice a week. And I'd say, and he'd say, oh yeah, we were talking about Jerusalem stone and designs and Ari had some really good ideas. Little did I know that very early in one of those dinners, he said to you, Ari, I got four kids that are Jewish. I've got my mother, my mother-in-law is a Holocaust survivor. My wife's Jewish. I feel Jewish. What do I have to do to become Jewish? So little did I know that those dinners and those meetings, there was other stuff happening, you know, that he was talking. All he said is, I feel Jewish. What do I have to do to become Jewish? Now, we're not Orthodox, so he didn't have to learn a lot. Of, of, but he but he felt Jewish. Yeah. A lot of times when young people get married and they marry someone who's not Jewish, somebody, the Jewish parents say, well, you can't marry that person unless they become Jewish. And then somebody converts and they don't feel it. So I, Chuck went to temple. We had a Jewish family and he said he was tired of people saying to us, well, I, we know one of you is not Jewish. And sometimes they thought he was because he actually looks like a rabbi with his beard. <laughs> and he always said, we are a Jewish family. So flash forward, I'm working at my kid's summer camp and he comes and visits and he says, um, he has like this dreamy, he's home from Israel and he has like this celestial look about him. And I, he, he said, oh, I loved Israel, you know, the hummus and rabbi, we had so much fun, Dead Sea, we did this. And he's just like an Is Israel maniac. I said, if you like it so much, why don't you become Jewish? And he, and he looked at me and he said, maybe I already have. <laughs> and I was like, are you kidding? Are you? And I was upset. I said, you, you converted? And Without he said, you know, I was, it wasn't about you. And it wasn't about it was it, it had to come from me. And so that's and he didn't tell the kids until we, we went to the beach. We always go to Bethany Beach. I'm almost done with this story. So we're all sitting around our table at our beach house that we always go to. And, you know, we're eating and I think we were eating crabs. I'm sorry. But we were like sitting at the table and eating and we're drinking beer. And Chuck takes his his red uh, plastic cup and clinks it and says, dad has an announcement. <laughs> and the four boys are eating, you know, fries. Ignoring. And, and, <laughs> and he goes, I'm Jew I became Jewish. And they didn't even look up. They go, dad, we thought you were Jewish. We thought, <laughs> we always thought you were Jewish. So this big climax, you know, was like, so, but anyway, but for it's you was more important. I mean, that was so it meaningful. It was amazing. And I love it that he didn't tell me. I love it that it, it was his journey. It was his journey. And I love it. And, and, and it really means something to him. It, it yeah. means so much to him. Uh, I think he's an architectural Jew um, for oh, one, yes. but, but, but the whole idea of building this house of God for his community, it, 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 it's, we, you know, I can't go into that place without feeling the depth of our family and you, I can't, so go, thank you. I can't go into that place either without feeling the depth of, of Chuck and you and your family also. Like I, cause I well, know. I want to just say that I was one of the proudest moments and committees I served on, on many committees was I got to be on the committee that chose the rabbi. That's and right. I remember we were on a, a phone that was before zoom and, That's right. and we had the loudspeaker on and we're sitting in one of these rooms. And um, I don't know who asked the question that said, um, you're very tall, you know, I, I, it was not a great question, but you know, you're so tall. And I just said, do you see, you know, we're asking you hard questions. And I don't know if you remember, I said, do you see a basketball court in the future? <laughs> Temple of Bestialov? She said, maybe that's what had me at that. Maybe. <laughs> they, um, yeah. Well, it's, oh, we're so, what a good pick. We, uh, we picked well. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, and, and there is the, the great story about how, um, I came in for an interview and you weren't able to be there. And so I went over to your house and just sat and have had coffee with you one morning. And 
as I'm like talking to you and I see the, your, one of your books, I think it was surrendering to motherhood. And I'm like, Oh my God, I've seen this book. And it's cause Hannah, my wife was just, had been reading your book. And I was like, I remember calling her. I was like, guess who I, you're reading this book. Guess who I'm sitting here having, having coffee with. And that was like, I remember the beginning of a beautiful French. Uh, <laughs> I know. And, and also the beginning of me saying, you know, you have two, you may as well have four. <laughs> right. I remember <laughs> saying to Chuck, actually, when we were on the, on the, um, on one of our ri bus rides in Israel. And at that point, now we had, uh, didn't have three, but we had a third one on the way. And I said, you know, like, give me some advice here. And he said, I don't even know what to say. Well, you know, <laughs> I wasn't expecting four. <laughs> it's good. It, it's good. It's good that we're here. Thank you so much. And I hope that- This has been such know, a joy. This has been such me. an honor to have you here. And I know that you're going to, that this one's going to be a lot of fun for people to watch. And, um, and uh, yeah, and Iris, uh, I just thank you. To Darba, I am so best. grateful and uh, much love. Thank you so much for having me on the Ari Goldstein Show. That's right. Bye.